All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Bruegel's annual meeting uh, today. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome and host you here today. And as people are still making their way in, uh, I suspect that some get stuck perhaps uh, seeing their favorite uh, comic uh, on the way and um, uh, trying to to remember the whole stories. Uh, so, so we perhaps wait a little bit more further until people are, are coming up. Uh, but, uh, but let me welcome you to, uh, to our annual meeting today and thank you for all the support and all the work that has been put into, into this. I have to say my, um, my team very much enjoyed, our team very much enjoyed um, preparing uh, this annual meeting, not just because we look forward to the debate with you, uh, but also uh, because of the inspiring place. Um, and I think for those of you who have not yet had a look at the booklet, um, uh, the program booklet, um, please do so. Uh, they really, the team got inspired by uh, the various um, uh, comic uh, strips that um, uh, in the capital of, uh, of comics, uh, Belgium, uh, Brussels, um, uh, uh, is, is being produced here, and so, so, so we very much got, got inspired by, um, uh, by these comics and, and very much look, look forward to, to debating with you, not just the comics, but I think a lot of uh, serious economic, economic issues. Uh, so today we will discuss um, the economic priorities for the next five years. We will be discussing uh, Europe's instruments to be an effective global player, we will discuss the social impact of uh, decarbonization. We will discuss the misthinking of globalization and, of course, also the future of Europe's financial system. And even you will get a chance, if you want to, uh, to, to do a guided tour uh, through the special exposition here on Chinese uh, comic strips. So, uh, so, so that might be enjoyable before, before dinner. Our discussion tomorrow will focus on euro area reform as well as on the digital uh, transformation of our societies. Um, perhaps one thought um, before uh, moving to the first panel, um, which is about uh, the, um, of course, the upcoming, the important moment um, uh, in which we are currently. We are at the moment where um, we are only nine months ahead of the European elections, and I think uh, it's fair to say that um, we are seeing an increasingly polarized debate um, for uh, this European election, but also in the national elections. I think in Chemnitz uh, in the last few days, we've seen just how strong political forces on the right are by now, have become uh, nationalist forces, um, um, anti-Islam, anti-even uh, democracy forces have become. And I think it's a, it's, a real, it's a real source of worry, and we should think very carefully about what is the right response, uh, response to this. The question is whether one response, uh, is whether the right response is uh, going, going full in with liberalism, uh, untamed liberalism, or whether there is a need to, to find a more um, sort of centrist answer to this, um, to this challenge. And I think that's one of the uh, the things we will be debating um, uh, in this in this annual meeting, uh, be it um, be it over coffee or be it in our panels, um, I think for the EU the big questions uh, are certainly whether um, the EU will allow and in, uh, will actually enable uh, national welfare states to be strong, national communities to be strong, regional communities to be strong. I think it will also be a big question. Um, whether um, uh, the, the welfare states um, can remain strong uh, in, in, uh, in, in this time of, of turbulence. Now, I think uh, my, my colleague uh, Joel Davos, for example, has done excellent work on the topic of inequality, uh, which we don't discuss this time at the annual meeting, uh, but it's certainly a topic that uh, I think should also be very high on, on our agenda. Now it's our role here at, at Bruegel to um, provide evidence-based analysis to all of these questions and to provide you with a platform to debate these questions. Um, 
uh, here at Bruegel in an open uh, and free way. And that's why I'm now very pleased to um, welcome uh, the panelists uh, for our first panel uh, that we have co-organized with um, the Financial Times. Um, and uh, if I could just ask you to, uh, to move to the stage, come to the stage, please. Thank you. Well, wel welcome to, uh, to our, first, uh, our first panel. We want to debate uh, what should be the economic priorities for Europe in the, next, in the next five years. And I'm very pleased uh, to have with me Jan van Overfeld, uh, Minister of Finance of Belgium, uh, Laurie Evans, Director General of the European Commission's Internal Market Industry and Entrepreneurship Directorate, uh, Martin Sanfu, um, the free lunch um, writer of the Financial Times. I'm always looking there to see whether there is a free lunch, but I haven't found out yet. Um, and, of course, uh, Maria de Merz's deputy director at, at Bruegel. And I would say in, in that order, um, we uh, look forward to uh, short opening statements, um, um, and then we want to have a debate and, of course, bring you in uh, the audience uh, with questions and remarks. So, Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning on my part, too, and congratulations for Bruegel for... Uh, Again, probably very interesting, or most certainly very interesting annual meeting. Uh, I just want to make briefly five points in terms of economic priorities. Uh, a first of all uh, remark uh, is, I think, with respect to Europe, we, we are excellent at discussing and coming to conclusions or par partial conclusions. We're less good at implementation on the country or the member state level. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be an overall concern that we should be much more focused on actual implementation of uh, the things we agree upon uh, and the measures we, uh, we take. Now, with specifics, uh, first of all, um, obviously the trade discussion that is going on worldwide is very important, uh, certainly for Europe. And um, th there's, of course, a strategic choice to make, whether you take a kind of hardline position where when you have something coming out of Washington because that's where most of the things with respect to trade come out of today uh, or you take a more moderate position and try to calm things down I think the second line is somewhat more obvious for Europe and uh, I was very uh, uh, pleased or enthusiastic about the recent proposal of the European Commission we will bring down tariffs if you bring down tariffs too I think that's an excellent line to take uh, with respect to trade, but obviously that's uh, a major priority for the European and the national authorities to try to calm down on the trade front. Secondly, EMU, obviously, monetary union. We have the single uh, supervisory mechanism. We have the single resolution board. We should get to uh, cross-European deposit insurance, but we cannot do that after further until we have further risk reduction. First risk reduction, then risk sharing. Which brings me to another point, part of the second major point, the necessity, and I think this is of the utmost importance, of having a capital markets union. It's a lot of work to be done there, but it is of the utmost importance because obviously, I think uh, we are here to state uh, things that are true and that uh, we should recognize. Public risk sharing is a problematic issue if you witness discussions within the Eurogroup or at the ECOFIN level, you're very much aware of that. So we should try to reach the highest possible level of private risk sharing. And with respect to that, integrated capital markets are, again, I repeat, of the utmost importance. But they are important for other things. Capital markets union is important for other things too. You need deep and well-integrated capital markets to allow a healthy securitization process which in turn is important for uh, getting to healthy banking balance sheets. And a third issue for which capital markets union is very important is we have a lot of start-up capital for new ventures in, in Europe. There's no lack of that uh, 
uh, in, in practically every country of the U European mm -hmm. Union. We have a huge problem in terms of growth finance. We have a lot of startups. We have a lot of startups once they get to the up, when they, when they get to, through the first phase of learning how to do it, if I may put it that way, a lot of them leave Europe, not because market considerations or technology, no, for funding. They go to New York, one of the favorite places, to other places. So I think the capital markets union is of the utmost importance to keep promising startups also here in Europe. Uh, Europe. A third issue uh, related to that, because let's be honest, we are all getting very critical of the Amazons and the Googles and the Apples of the world, but we envy the Americans that they have these companies. We don't have them, or certainly not to the degree, to the degree that the Americans have them, and that has a lot to do, not only of course, but that has a lot to do with the capital markets union issue that I just uh, mentioned. With respect to these tech companies, my third point, after uh, trade, EMU, tech companies, um, we are discussing at the moment a tax initiative to make them pay their fair share. I think that's fair to do. Uh, they are actually not, their, not paying their fair share. But we should be well aware of the fact that the major issue, in my opinion, it's not so much that tax issue. It's important, but it's not the major issue. The ma major issue with respect to these companies is, of course, market power. And I think uh, Commissioner Vestager has been doing very interesting, uh, to say the least, uh, a very interesting job with respect to these companies. But uh, we should be uh, very conscious of the fact that we have here market developments that are certainly not competitive. And so we should be well aware of, uh, of that. Fourth element of my uh, short list, I thought you, uh, in the preparations, you said we had seven minutes, so that's 1.25 seconds uh, <laughs> if, if you divide it by five or 24, yeah. Uh, structural reforms, of course, very important. Uh, barriers to entry, barriers to competition in product markets, in labor markets. A lot has been done. But I dare say that even as much still needs to be done than what has been done. There are, of course, major differences between member states, but uh, we certainly should be working on that issue uh, also, uh, closely related to that investment, public investment, infrastructure. We all know that there's a lot, again, to be done in terms of infrastructure. Uh, given the state of public finances in most countries, not all of them, happily, luckily, but most of them, I think we should focus on private public cooperation and with uh, the restatement of the rules of the game by uh, Eurostat, I think there are a lot of additional possibilities. These structural reforms are very important to get the growth that we need in order to be able to continue to finance our welfare states. It's quite simple, no growth, no welfare state. It's as simple as that. And last but not least, the migration issue which is, of course, also from an economic point of view, very important, where until now responses have from the European level have been a little bit cha chaotic, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a complicated issue. Uh, human element, human values play, a, of course, a great role here. Economic issue, financial issues are also important. You c one cannot deny that. And we should at least get to, uh, we need migration, that's for sure, at the EU level, but we need to get it in a more controlled way than uh, we have until now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Um, let me now turn to uh, Lori Evans from DG, uh, DG um, Internal Markets. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let me start by saying I agree with everything the Minister has said, so that takes uh, a few things out of my speech for the time, that's good. I've got three points, but my main point is to try and emphasize even more this year than we were doing last year, the importance of the single market, okay? So the, what's the context? The economic context is positive. So we have good performance broadly in the European economy, 
but we have relative to last year and going forward a little bit more uncertainty in the offing, a bit more global uncertainty. So the first premise is that a dynamic, better functioning EU internal market is more important than ever. It's more important this year than last year. It's going to remain much more important going forward. Um, some good news, as well as the economic performance uh, that we're doing right now, is that the investment performance in Europe has been improving. So relative to, shall we say, three or four years ago, that's improved a lot. But I think we still need to understand there's a structural relative weakness in the European economy on investment. Mr. Juncker came in saying that. I think that Mr. Juncker's successor should be saying it as well. Uh, we have done a lot in the last few years to get more uh, impulse into incentivizing investment in the European economy to create the better business conditions. But that job is not done. We've improved, but it's not done. Uh, the thing that we have not come to grips with at all, I would argue, is that the growth rate of the EU potential output remains relatively low. So the heads of state have been slow to recognize this. So if we're talking about the next year, the next five years, politically, this would be the feature, the political feature I would like to see improved. So last year, Mr. Juncker was saying, the sun is shining, it's time to fix the roof. If you don't fix the roof when the sun is shining, uh, you never are going to do it. So I am arguing as well as fixing the roof, which is EMU fundamentally, it's time to have a much better look at the foundations of the house as well, the microeconomic foundations of the house, because they need a little bit of fixing as well. The house is going to stand up with these foundations, but we can't build the house bigger with these foundations, is the analogy that we're doing. So we need a, a really good and critical look on the microeconomic foundations of the single market. Because basically, the better the single market works, the better the EU can harness globalization. If we have a very productive EU internal market, we stand the best possible chance of remaining winners in global competition. So this focus on competitiveness, this focus on productivity, this focus on the microeconomic aspect of the European economy needs, needs a better uh, political attention. Because we know that the single market has been delivering growth for the European economy, but has been under-delivering growth for the European economy. And we still have substantial growth potential that is not being delivered. I mean, for example, um, some services segment, this is well known, uh, are fragmented, uh, over-regulated, and uh, not delivering uh, growth. This is more important statement now than it would have been three to five years ago, because the breakdown between services and manufacturing uh, is, is what we are experiencing. The value added much or even most of the value added of manufacturing exports comes from services. So when I talk about underexploited growth potential in services, it's for the whole value chain. It's about the competitiveness, the relative competitiveness of EU manufacturing exports. And it's growing. That's a trend that's there. Uh, and it's not sufficiently recognized yet. And there are other dimensions of the single market going belong beyond the classic services, goods uh, analysis that we need to focus on. The minister had talked about the capital markets union, that's a fundamental underlying pillar. But there are others, energy markets, for example. Uh, we have been focusing on the investment dimension of European energy market, but there are still regulatory technical obstacles that haven't been focused on enough. And most of that regulation is at national level. Transport, for example, is a key enabler for growth. That's been in the textbooks for a million years. We've, we all know about the unrealized railway transport system, for example. But there are new challenges for the single market in transport that come from, for example, electric vehicles. 
we are focusing on that right now. Um, national regulation of those dimensions would, of course, be disastrous. So preventing future fragmentation against uh, changing uh, dynamic is really, really important. Um, so what is needed is to understand that the proper functioning of the single market is not just about regulation at EU level, legal change, but about designing a policy mix at EU level plus national level plus regional level and making sure that this is optimized in terms of market design for all of the segments and for the underlying uh, business attraction of, uh, of, of the investment in particular. Last point I want to make at this stage is to emphasize this regional dimension, this focus on place. If we are talking about implementation, if we are talking about microeconomics, a lot of the decisions are taken at regional level or even at local level. And this is not so far in the mix of European policymaking. We have it to a slight extent at, uh, in terms of cohesion policy, but the design of cohesion policy has been done in a very microscopic way at the local level without joining up all of the design uh, in a way that is coherent across the EU in a way that is coherent in terms of delivering a better single market. And the challenge for the next MFF is to get the cohesion agenda aligned with the European economic policy as it needs to be. This is not there. And another dimension of that is not only to reduce the regional disparities that are increasing in Europe, and I can talk more about that afterwards, but also to be sure that we are bringing the people along. If we do not have the necessary skills agenda, for example, to deliver the future skills, the today skills and the future skills that we need, we won't be able to design the economic policy in a way that brings people along with it. Uh, we already have flaws there. The risks on that are increasing, not decreasing. Well, thank you, thank you, very, thank you very much. Um, let me just mention there's a few seats up here. Um, if people want to move uh, here in the center or uh, there on the left, please do so because um, we still have an hour of session ahead of us. So I don't want you to, to stand for the entire hour. So, so please feel free to move uh, here in, in front. Um, so, so thank you, thank you, Lori, for for pointing out um, the importance of the um, of the single market and you know advancing that agenda, which is of course um, a, a key topic uh, on which we are talking, uh, on which we are often talking about, which we are often talking here in Brussels. Um, uh, I guess uh, that is not probably not the main thrust of um, what Martin uh, wants to say, Martin. Uh, Sanpu from the Financial Times, uh, you have the word now. Thank you, and, and congratulations to Bruegel. It's a delight to be partnering with you, and for somebody whose job it is to uh, cover and report on and analyze policy-relevant economic research, Bruegel always is a treasure trove of uh, useful reading. Um, it would be true but boring to say that I agree with everything that's been said in the sense that everything, all the policy initiatives that have been mentioned are very much worthwhile. I disagree that they are priorities, or at least I disagree they are top priorities. I think uh, we run a great risk by forgetting the short run in Europe. I believe we are still well below the full capacity, full productive capacity of the European economy. The recovery is welcome. It's been going for, what is it, five years now? It's still soft, I think. It's still weak. I still think we should recognize that uh, the European economy is operating significantly below potential. Uh, that's not a consensus view. Um, but to me, it seems nearly obvious that we shouldn't be satisfied in thinking that we're sort of at the, at the potential where it's only kind of long-term, the low-term growth rate is the best we can hope for. We still have a lot of catch-up to do after the crisis. This is obvious in quite a lot of individual countries, 
anywhere that unemployment is higher than it was 10 years ago, we should realize that there's more to do in terms of just old-fashioned demand stimulus, macroeconomic stimulus. Um, even for the Eurozone or the EU as a whole, there are strong signs that in the aggregate, we're still below full capacity. One of those signs is that compared to where it looked like the economy was headed before the crisis, the pre-crisis trend, depending on the country, we're still 10, 20 percent below. Some of that can be explained by unsustainable growth before the crisis. Some of it can be explained by capacity that has been lost in the mismanagement of the crisis, but not all of it. There must still be quite a lot of slack that should be caught up with. Uh, and finally, of course, the telltale signs of overheating are just not there. There's no inflationary pressure. So let's not forget about the short run. Every day that we don't have an aggressive macroeconomic policy is a day where we leave money on the table, as it were, where we leave livelihoods and jobs and incomes lower and lesser than they should be. So there's a sort of a plain short-term macroeconomic priority here. But there's a second reason to focus on the short run, and it is that all these worthwhile long-term initiatives, and they, they are correct, all of them, but they are much harder to do in a weak macroeconomic environment than in a strong economic environment. Take, you know, an, an obvious example is labor market reform. That's still necessary in many countries. It's much easier, both politically and economically, to carry out labor market reform if there is strongly growing aggregate demand that creates new jobs that people can go into. It's much easier to exploit opportunities from a deepening single market if there's strong demand for new business opportunities. And we could go on with pretty much every long-term reform. It's much easier to deal with the legacy problem of debts in the banking system or sovereign debt if you have strong growth. So pretty much across the board, a uh, greater effort on the short-term macroeconomic policy, more stimulus. I'm sounding like an unreconstructed Keynesian here, but I think it's true in Europe. Uh, across the board, it's easier to do it, all these it's things. It's the free lunch, right? Right. Yeah. That, but no, well, you're right. It's, there, there is sometimes a free lunch in economics. Right? Um, for all of these things, it's much easier and more likely that we'll succeed if we have what US, U.S. economists would call a high-pressure economy. And the third reason for this is uh, something that, that you hinted at, the regional disparities in Europe. Like in the U.S., Europe has thriving core economic areas, and it has left-behind areas. I mentioned the regional dimension, but of course you can, you can look at it in along a lot of different dimensions between different types of people, different type of demographic groups, and so on, income inequality. But the point is that what looks like overheating among those who are doing well only looks like the very first stirrings of growth for the more marginalized parts of the economy. That could be the left behind areas, it could be immigrant workers, it could be other people who are marginalized in the labor market. But the point is that we should think macroeconomically not just about the average but about the margin. And it seems a regularity that is people on the margin who lose out the first, lose out first in a crisis or in a recession and who are caught up last in the recovery. So for goodness sake, let's not slow down the recovery or forget about the need to stimulate it just when it's people on the margin who are starting to benefit from it which we are seeing. Right? We have high employment rates in many European countries, record high in some of them. That's good. That means people who formerly were outside of the labor market now can get jobs. It's often not good jobs. So why not have an economic environment where they also see some wage growth? And this, again, I'm, I'm saying things that I think should be obvious here. This matters politically. The rise of the anti-liberal nativist right in particular, but also some of the extreme left, is not all to do with economics, but it's a lot to do with economics. 
there's been a sense, a true sense, of decline for large groups of the population in most European countries for 20, 30 years. They have a right to be angry. They are quite wrong to be angry in the way that many of them are. So I'm not saying that uh, what we see on the street of Chemnitz is mostly to do with economics, but it's also to do with economics. And it seems to me that a little bit of overheating, economic overheating in a place like Chemnitz could do everyone some good. So how I, I think I've used up my time. Uh, I have ideas about the long term, but I'll right. get to them in discussion. So just to conclude, uh, I don't disagree with anything that's been said, but I find myself in this sort of strange position for econom an economics commentator uh, to be saying that the politicians are too focused on the long run. Well, well thank, you, thank you, Martin, and I, I'm sure we will have lots of debate on, on what you, you've been saying. I mean, I, I, I certainly find it uh, striking that you emphasize so much the, uh, the macro and at the same time advocate uh, labor market liberalization, whereas many people, I guess, in Chemnitz, and you refer to Chemnitz, would have, would have said it exactly the opposite, the, the other way around. They would have said, look, uh, uh, our, our livelihoods, economic livelihoods, are bad because of the labor market reforms that have been enacted and not because of the missing macroeconomic stimulus. So, so perhaps you keep your answer for... Uh, for Just that not all labor market reforms are alike. Yeah, right. So, so I, I think there is a, a thing we can discuss here. Uh, but let me uh, first, uh, first go to Maria and then we'll, we'll have a debate, I'm sure, on all these various aspects. Maria. Uh, thank you very much, Guntram, and thank you to my uh, colleagues here for very interesting points. Um, and I'm delighted actually that I come last because I, I'm going to follow up with what, where Martin left it. And, you know, whether we go with, talk about the, lo the long run, the short run, I would, I would emphasize more the medium to short run as well. I think there is, there is, there is value in, in, in sort of trying to secure that the short run is healthy, otherwise the long run is just not visible enough. Um, so I would like to add my two pens and, and argue that uh, economic reform is required to have certain conditions. And so I would like to emphasize conditions on which we can reform in whichever way we seem appropriate. But I'd like to, to make a point that the conditions for, for reform are perhaps not ideal. Now, if you look back in the, what we've accomplished in the past 10 years, certainly from the perspective of European architecture, we moved to the speed of light. Banking union and ESM are institutions that were were made from scratch uh, and they were advanced at a very, very high stage uh, in at a speed that is not typical of the speed that the European, uh, Europeans move. So that, that, that's good news. But there, there were existential measures. There were measures that were necessary uh, in order to ensure that the uh, uh, European Union would continue to exist. They're very far from finished. And here I would like to join the chorus of many of you here who would argue that we need to finish what we started banking union, reforming the SM. And if I was to add one extra uh, variable here, I would say that fiscal capacity of some sort, the size of which we can discuss, is something that we really need to add uh, in order to ensure that we match the policy in scope of monetary policy. Um, but if I wanted to make a guess whether we're going to achieve much progress in this in the next five years, then there I would say that I don't think we will. And the question is why. Um, I don't believe that we will make much progress on these issues um, because that we don't have the right conditions to make progress in, this condition, in, this, in these issues. And what do I mean by that? I mean three things. I possibly mean many more, but I think three are the ones that I'd like to point out. The first one is that there is very little trust. There is very little trust between the countries, and I dare say that there is little trust on Europe, on Europe or European institutions. This is very unfortunate. To be fair, the issue of trust or the lack of trust is not something that is unique to Europe or indeed to the European edifice. It is broader than that, and it's, there is very interesting discussions on what do we mean by trust and how do we acquire trust. But I certainly believe that the lack of trust is an incredible obstacle to finishing, advancing the European integration. The minister talked about risk reduction. I think it starts there. Uh, there, is, there is lack of trust that we are capable of reducing risk in some, uh, some areas. And if it, that's a precondition for more risk sharing, well, we're not going to get it. Um, my second point is that there is an enormous heterogeneity in Europe. And there is heterogeneity in the structures of the economies, but I dare say that is also heterogeneity in what countries actually want. And that's an important fact. Um, in my view. If we ignore what country preferences are, this is going to uh, threaten the stability of Europe. 
Um, the challenge here is how do we stay close to what countries actually want when countries are so heterogeneous? That, I think, is an important challenge that needs to be, to be met. And the third point, and I zoom now in into this heterogeneity because I think that's very, very important, uh, both for the countries themselves but also for the European Union, Union is on the quality of governance that we see uh, across uh, different countries. And here I mean the rule of law, I mean the, trans I mean the issues like um, corruption, the quality of public administration, openness of press. These are fundamentals for any reforms to take place including economic reforms. In his introduction, Guntram talked about the threat of democracy that we see coming up to elections with the discrepancy in the quality of governance uh, um, and the rule of law in Europe. There's very little, I think, in my view, that we can achieve and very little that is actually sustainable in the future. That, in my view, ought to be a priority if we're talking about uh, um, uh, securing the checks and balances that define Western democracies in the way that we like to define them. Um, if you add to this the very bitterly di uh, divisive the conversations that we have on, on migration or indeed the economic migrants, then I doubt that we have much uh, uh, basis, common basis, uh, that is going to help us move forward. So that the question really isn't about completing the banking union. <laughs> the question is, is how do you restore trust? How do you reduce heterogeneity? And how do you induce that, uh, the, how do you ensure that the rule of law um, uh, holds in a way that is commensurate with what we call European expectations. Um, um, here I really think that the European Commission has a role to play. I think we have ways of monitoring this. On the macroeconomic side we have a very, in my view, uh, useful microeconomic imbalances procedure that has raised awareness about this issue following the crisis. I think we need to, to uh, create indicators and measure governance in quite the similar frequency as we do with the macroeconomic balances procedures. We talk about structural reforms. The mantra that came both from the IMF and the Commission was competitiveness and production. I would argue uh, we should go back to structural reforms 0.0, .0 uh, which uh, uh, have to do with the quality of our institutions. Uh, and let me finish with, uh, um, with perhaps a couple of... Um, I'm sure the conversation is going to be quite interesting, but let me ask a few questions which I think are uncomfortable questions, but we need to, uh, we need to think about them. Could it just be that we might have reached some kind of limit of what a Europe of 28 in the current architecture can actually deliver? I think that's an important question to ask. It, it surely it is difficult for 28 countries, and if you believe in enlargement, which I certainly believe, uh, soon to be maybe 38 uh, countries, can we all move at the same pace? And can we all move at the same destination? Um, I think these are questions that we need to ask because if we don't have convincing answers that take into consideration the preferences of countries and at the same time ensure that we have a sustainable Europe, we won't make uh, much, uh, much progress. Now, I don't have clear answers to these questions, but I certainly think that we need to calibrate the discussion away from all the things that we disagree um, and towards uh, the question as to why it is that uh, we disagree. I think that needs to be the discussion we need to have in the next five years, much more uh, uh, than uh, architectural issues like capital markets union or indeed uh, the more short-run issues. I'll stop here and pick up in the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Maria, for uh, putting the finger on these, these important questions and uh, emphasizing the role of trust and the role of good, good governance and good institutions um, uh, as, as priorities uh, for, for our policymakers in the next five years. Now, I could see that... Um, the minister got uh, got sort of um, uh, uh, nervous and wanted to react to um, uh, to uh, Martin. Uh, so, so perhaps you, you I'll, I'll give you the floor to react to this idea that we need a high pressurized uh, economy to be able to do all these reforms that that you've been talking about. Do we need that, or do we not? Do we not need it? In those four years in politics, I learned that uh, to be nervous or to get nervous doesn't help you. On the contrary, so uh, <laughs> if if you read that into my into my body language, you were slightly wrong, but <laughs> only slightly, because indeed I have uh, a certain inclination to uh, slightly disagree with Martin, um, with very argues for aggressive macroeconomic policies. Um, is that monetary policy or is that budgetary policy or is that both? I think with respect to monetary policy, um, the central banks, the European Central Bank, have been doing a wonderful job during the financial crisis. 
what I have been doing afterwards was writing the book while doing the action, which is of course very difficult, so, so we should all be very humble about criticizing uh, that policy, but it's hard to deny that, the, let's say in general, the QE policies have some intended, unintended consequences that become more visible the longer you prolong this kind of policy. So in terms of a more aggressive, a still more aggressive monetary policy, I don't really see the point. Uh, in terms of budgetary policies, of course, many countries are different. But uh, overall, I think a certain cautiousness is needed here, uh, unfortunately for the long run. And it, it's indeed a little bit striking that the journalist is, uh, I'm a former journalist, uh, is calling for the short run issues, whereas he says that the politicians are focusing too much on the long run. Uh, it's the first time I hear that uh, coming to me, uh, that kind of accusation uh, coming this way. But you, you're right, there's still a lot of potential unused, but you can unlock that potential only through what we call structural policies. Think about the labor market. Um, we have now, let me give the example of Belgium. We have now the most job intensive growth we ever had in Belgium. Per percentage growth, we have uh, the num a number of job, uh, uh, of job creation that has never been higher in history. That has, amongst other things, to do with the fact that in our tax shift operation, we increased incentives to work. Supply side of the labor market, there's a demand side, but there's also a supply side. And of course, when we talk about potential growth, you talk basic economics, economics 101, productivity, labor participation. Labor participation with the aging of the population, you can do something about the pension age, but you, do, you need to do some things about structural unemployment. Education, the long run, tax incentives to increase uh, the incentive to work, that, that works in the short run. Uh, the same with investment. I think it would be very unwise to launch huge public investment uh, uh, initiatives like we used to have in the past. I think we need to be clever, we need to be uh, selective, and we need to focus on public-private uh, cooperation like I said earlier. And with respect to growth, a bottom line, overall, for example, for a country like Belgium, growth was relatively disappointing. But once you make the distinction between the contribution to growth between public and private sector, you see a totally different picture coming up. We have now basically large average or, or broad averages, three years of 1.5% growth, a little bit more, a little bit less. That's zero or even slightly negative contribution from the public sector. We had a, we started uh, this government with more than 3% deficit, 110% government debt. Uh, so we needed to, to do something there. We did it, and I think we did it in a moderate but consistent way. The private sector growth has been on average 3%, which I think is quite healthy and quite strong. But of course, given 50-50% broadly private and public sector, your overall growth is 1.5, and that's relatively disappointing. But underneath, you see a quite strong private sector expansion. And I think that was the only way we could go, given the circumstances in which we were. May I add a uh, another a second remark on what Maria has been saying in terms of trust? Yes, you're right. We need to rebuild trust. But I think one of the things you need in order to be able to rebuild trust is to have the facts and figures on the table. And let me give a specific example on uh, further steps in the banking union, the non-performing loans of the banks, major issue. may sound a little bit technical, but it's, it's, it's a major issue, believe me. We need to be, you cannot ask everybody, or you cannot ask to take responsibility of things that happened in the past. That's, that, that's an elementary insurance principle. You take collective responsibility from the moment your insurance policy starts, not from things that date from before. So unless, first of all, there's more clarity about where we stand on MPLs in some countries, first, and secondly, that there is clear 
controllable action on how you reduce that, it will indeed be very difficult to rebuild trust. But first things first. But there haven't been enough uh, stress tests um, telling us uh, how much NPLs we have um, in the various systems? There's still some discussion about that and there's especially a lot of discussion on what has been done in order to reduce that. Uh, and nobody asks to, to reduce that in six or 12 months time, but you need to have uh, a credible, uh, controllable plan of what you will do. And that needs to be in stone before you can take steps further in the banking union. Right. Um, okay, um, per perhaps let me go back to, to Martin because uh, Jörn, you, you reacted to, to Martin, so I wanna give, give Martin a chance to react to a few points. But, but perhaps let me push you a bit on this point um, of, um, of labor market reforms and, uh, uh, and macro stimulus. I mean, why did you single out the labor market issue uh, so prominently and not, let's say, issues of product market regulation, lack of competition, service market regulation, and so on? I'm, I'm always puzzled, and, and it appears quite often that I, you hear a lot on the labor market reform, and you hear, hear relatively little on what, what Laurie was saying, um, even though there's, I mean, there's no, not so clear evidence that the labor market institutions themselves are actually a problem. And by the way, I would argue that um, since we mentioned the Chemnitz issue, that the labor market issues are much, much more sensitive um, to, to citizens' lives um, uh, than uh, you know, uh, 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 regulation or deregulation of certain segments of the, of the services sector. So, so, so why this combination macro stimulus and labor market reform and not macro stimulus and uh, other structural reforms um, you know, in principle, uh, sort of in, in theory, um, you know, uh, uh, having a well-functioning uh, uh, services market, product markets, could just as well achieve full employment uh, than having a well-functioning, uh, non-distorted labor market. So, so perhaps you can enlarge a little bit on that. Yeah, no, these are all good points. I mentioned three examples, labor markets, uh, single market deepening, which will include cutting barriers to uh, services trade and dealing with... Uh, debt overhang in banks and among sovereigns. Those, those are just three examples I mentioned that will be helped by stronger short-term growth stimulus. Uh, but you're right, I mentioned labor markets first and it's, I think because it's one of the most salient issues, partly because it's been politically controversial, it was a core and to many, in many cases mismanaged part of the uh, bailout packages, for example, the conditionalities. Uh, and that's why it comes, it's sort of high up in my mind. You will not hear me defend the German version of labor market reforms from the early 2000s. Uh, there are many ways of doing labor market reforms. Uh, but one reason why I brought that up first is because when you do labor market reforms in a weak macroeconomic environment, it can often make, make things worse. And, and you know, we've known this for a long time. The, you know, the IMF research department <laughs> has, you know, explain this ad nauseum even while the IMF teams on the ground and the European periphery seem to be acting differently, right? Uh, so we know that if you just make it easier to fire people when there's no demand for new jobs or for new uh, production, then you'll just get a lot of unemployment. Um, on the German uh, reforms, look, there are th you can think of two sort of archetypal ways of doing labor market reforms when you have labor market rigidity. One is to uh, increase incentives for workers to take worse jobs at lower wages. That's what Germany did. Uh, the other is to, instead of focus on labor costs, to focus on the flexibility side for employers. That's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm simplifying it, but that's sort of what France is trying to do. Uh, I think the latter is far superior to the former. If you emphasize labor costs too much, you end up with policies that more or less have as their aim to reduce wages. Uh, I think it's better to accept and actually encourage labor costs in the sense of wages to be as high as you can get them uh, in, in an equilibrium situation, but work on the flexibility side so that you get people shifting easily from less productive jobs to more high productive jobs. But for that, you need strong demand pressures so that those new jobs start appearing. So you want a situation where you have strongly growing demand, where it's easy for labor to shift, and capital for that matter, to shift from 
older, less productive, maybe smaller companies to more modern, more productive, more automated perhaps, and perhaps larger companies. I mean, most productivity growth you see, historically, a lot of it has to do with shifting from the less efficient type of economic organization to the more efficient type. So that's what Europe has always been, or has for a couple of decades been pretty bad at, and that's what we have to be better at, that's the right kind of labor market reform, and that's what goes together with macroeconomic stimulus. But, you know, apart from that, I don't think I disagree with anything that the other panelists have emphasized as priorities. But you don't need logically to disagree, right? You can emphasize both. You can have the right long-term initiatives in place, and you can say that it's important to keep demand pressure high now. The risk I see is that there's a neglect of the short term. That means we might let go, you know, let up on the accelerator. I think that would be very harmful. Thanks, uh, L Laurie. I, I think you, you want to react to some of what has been said, but p perhaps you can also give us a little bit more of a hint at uh, why progress with service uh, market liberalization uh, and service market integration, a single market for services, has been rather slow. I mean, it's been for, for years and years that we've been talking about these issues, but progress, progress is rather slow, isn't it? Okay, I'll give you a straightforward answer to your question and then I'll make some wider comments. I think our attitude, our political, our political attitude to services liberalization, which is what it was when it was launched 10 years ago, was uh, obtuse and not politically smart. Uh, I think we thought we could do it uh, from ideological analysis, probably correct, uh, through the legal means and it's, it has not worked. Let me declare it a failure. So I think we have to do it again from the economic angle. And either we have an economic case, wh which is shared analysis, not just by the EU elite, if you like, but by the member states, by the businesses, by the citizens, and we go for it collectively, not coercively. We perhaps design incentives. Uh, or we don't. I think that the missing element in the failure is uh, a common and shared belief that it was the right thing to do. So it was legislated, but it was not implemented. The, so the straightforward story is this. So the diagnosis now is to go through the same analysis, well, with the, with the economic change that we have now, the present economic situation that we have now, which is not exactly the same. It's more favorable to that reform now than it was 10 years ago. Um, through persuasion, through the semester, and perhaps through some incentivization through uh, European level uh, financial instruments. Uh, but you know, let's see. So that's the straightforward answer. You, I, I think you're agreeing with it because you're nodding. Um, what the, the, the point I want to take up from Martin is that he misunderstands me completely and perhaps the minister as well. If he characterizes what we say as long-term objectives. There is, I would argue, urgency, therefore a short-term imperative for the European competitiveness story to be improved. Otherwise, we will fall further behind the long-term potential of China, right? China is catching up so fast. It's not a threat now, but it's an, a potential threat. If we do not fix our foundations now, now, today, short-term imperative, we will lose the race. And then we will lose uh, the, whole, the whole story. We will lose the jobs. We will lose the jobs. All of the jobs. You know, really a lot of the jobs. All of the jobs that are tradable. And that's really a lot of them. And the wealth which is tradable. We will lose the wealth. So it's a short-term imperative. So there are things that we need to grapple with as a matter of urgency. This regional disparity thing, uh, the difference between leading and laggard regions. So if you like, the way that Paris or London is performing, they're leading regions, right? Uh, they're doing really, really well. So if we would have national policies, not European policies, national policies that enabled the other parts of France, the other parts of the UK to perform as well as London and Paris, that would be dem demand enhancing. Uh, it would also be demand stimulus. Uh, 
not just uh, structural reform. It would be, this would have a demand stimulus to it. And it would have a better equity outcome. It would produce better politics. Fewer people left behind. So it's urgent. It's urgent to deal with the impact of digitalization. You know, product markets now are not the same as product markets 10 years ago. All product markets, all service markets are digitized. The consequences of that has to be addressed now. The public services have to be changed now. We have to make those investments now. This is urgent, this is short term. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for emphasizing this, this point of regional disparities, which, which I think is actually an important uh, issue to look at, given the polarization that I mentioned at the beginning of our societies. I mean, the polarization that we are seeing often is a city countryside polarization. I mean, we've seen it in the Brexit vote. We've seen it, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the votes um, in, uh, in France. We've, we are also seeing it, of course, in the, in the elections, uh, in the various elections in Germany. The cities vote very differently from the countryside. And so the kind of po what kind of policies we really have to sort of overcome uh, uh, the economic difficulties that uh, some regions have, such as Chemnitz, but many others, I think uh, is certainly, certainly a big issue to look at. Um, per perhaps um, I can push the minister on, on one of the points, and also perhaps Maria wants to react to that point, on one of the points that you mentioned at the beginning, which was on the trade discussion. What approach uh, should we take on trade? Should we have a more a hardline approach uh, um, where, you know, what comes out of Washington will be resisted with a clear and, and hard line, or should we rather have um, a more moderate uh, approach where, uh, you know, we try to accommodate some of, um, uh, of what is coming out of Washington, but perhaps also try to even, even uh, offer uh, more generous terms in, in terms of trade, lower tariffs on, on some, some cars and so on. You seem to um, favor the letter, um, and pr I was just wondering whether you could dwell a few minutes on it, explain why you, you favor the letter, um, and um, why you think that the rather hardline approach that I think initially was taken by the European Commission couldn't be considered a success. Because, I mean, to my mind, um, certainly one of the reasons why we've seen um, a rowing back in, in the US um, was that you know retaliation was was there and was becoming visible and you know was po possibly hurting uh, some of, some of the constituents of the U.S. president. So so where do you see this this battle trade battle going further? Well, <coughs> it's it's uh, obviously complicated, but the the baseline for me is that if we get a full scale trade war, we all lose, and certainly in Europe. So anything that can be done to avoid that is positive. So um, uh, I'm not so sure whether the backtracking in Washington, because it's backtracking today, or even now at 10 o'clock and at 11 o'clock, you, you may already get something else on your, uh, on your plate. Uh, so um, w w uh, there's certainly a lack of coherence about policies in Washington and, and initiatives and what's been said and, and to some extent what's been done. So take a careful position not to uh, of course, in terms of words, there's always the difference between words and deeds. Uh, in terms of words, you can argue strongly, but we should be very careful about what we actually do. And that is what we see in, in Washington also. Uh, at the end of the day, um, some action has been taken, but limited so far. So I think we should try to continue on, on that road. And like I said last week, if we will reduce rates, if you reduce them too, I think that's an excellent approach to, to take because that ma makes it difficult for Washington to, to keep on arguing in the way they've been doing. But my baseline is a full trade war, uh, trade war is a disaster and that we should avoid at all costs. Last, uh, very last point. I certainly certainly agree with that. I mean, measured action, measured reaction, is uh, is uh, is crucial for this respect. I mean, what is the objective? The objective is ensure that we can we can have free trade, because free trade is where we all benefit from, and ensure that we have a multilateral system to rely upon. And the question is, how do you get there? 
if you have aggressive behavior coming from uh, the US, what is the best way to try and bring them back into the dogma of uh, free trade? In my view, the EU has no option but to retaliate, and, and the option has to be measured and absolutely proportional. M Martin. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to agree with Maria, but I'd like to add some, some further thoughts. Uh, first, the minister said that you know, if we pursue a certain course, then Washington won't be able to argue something. I, I don't think we should delude ourselves that you know, the logical validity of the arguments coming out of DC is any constraint on US behavior at the moment. It's true that a tra in a trade war, we all lose, but, but let's be clear what we mean by a trade war in this case. We mean the US either choosing as a matter of policy to withdraw from the global trading system and repatriate supply chains, or to threaten to do that for tactical advantage. We don't really know. It's hard to know what President Trump actually wants. Uh, but in either case, it doesn't seem to me that Europe stands to gain from being emollient and giving concessions and so on, uh, which is why I agree that Europe probably does have to retaliate. If it's the, <laughs> the relatively less bad uh, case where all of these are basically threats and Trump doesn't really want to re-isolate the US economy, we still lose because then we are complicit in creating a world trading system that's based on bullying rather than the system of rules that Europe excels at in Europe and that Europe benefits from in the world. So we shouldn't go along with that. If the US really does want to isolate itself, to repatriate supply chains and be a more autarkic economy, there's not that much we can do about that except defend ourselves uh, to the best of our ability. And we do that, I think, first by not kind of giving in to the bullying, but more importantly by doubling down on trade liberalization with willing partners. And that means that the long-term strategic goal, or I should say the urgent strategic goal, <laughs> because I have a semantic point here. Uh, we don't disagree. The urgent uh, strategic goal for the long term yes. is, <laughs> is, um, is uh, kind of scary as it may sound, to try to envisage and build a world where Europe can do without the US. And, and that has broader implications than economically, but here I'm thinking about trade. So it may be that we have no better choice than to try to reinforce the liberal world trading system with those who are willing to stay in it and build up to the extent we can a world trading system that can survive, even thrive, with those who are willing to be part of it. That's not ideal, right? That's the end of the post-war era. But if that's what we're forced to do by a US policy choice, we really have to go for it. Just very quickly on the semantics. I, I, uh, plead guilty to being trained as an economist. So I tend to say short-term for cyclical measures and long-term for structural things that affect the permanent performance of the economy. So I, I don't think we disagree. So, so would you be worried about um, the social consequences of um, uh, opening, liberalizing trade to other economies while uh, shutting down to the US? I mean, after all, the US is a High, is still a high wage, uh, high wage economy, and if you liberalize to many others, they tend to have lower, lower wage, uh, wage uh, salary levels. Um, so I guess my my first first uh, hunch would be that um, the uh, distributional implications of liberalizing further to third countries uh, will affect the low wage uh, jobs um, in Europe rather rather over proportionally why the high wage shops might even might even benefit from from the US withdrawing no, we have to have our eyes open to this I think you're right uh, it's not only liberalizing with poorer countries there's more liberalizing that can be done with rich country partners right so there are FTAs now with Japan and with Canada there are some other high income economies we could pursue a strategy of m even much deeper integration with those countries if they're willing right, right? inside the EU We've, been, we've made the choice to integrate poorer and richer economies. That has been the right choice. It has been good for the richer countries and for the poorer countries. It's helped with convergence between those. It has had that price that integration has, that you point out. That doesn't mean it's the wrong choice. It means that we have to have the right flanking policies to deal with it. But the same is true for deepening the single market. 
So services liberalization, or more services competition across borders, it will make things uncomfortable for national service providers in a lot of countries. That's why it's not happening. Uh, and unfortunately, single market deepening probably has harmful regional consequences because more modern economies are concentrated on the sort of industries that thrive in cities. High skill, high knowledge services, and so on. So I think we have to admit the challenge here that a bigger, deeper, cross-country single market <coughs> may well be a mechanism for greater regional disparity between core and periphery within countries and across Europe. Uh, but we have to open our eyes to that, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It means that we have to find the right policies for making sure that the areas that would be left behind, if we left things alone, won't be. And that's skills development, right. infrastructure, and so on. Okay, be before, uh, before I open for questions, um, uh, Johan, you wanted, uh, Minister, you wanted to react no, to one of just the... Just a brief remark on the, uh, what Martin said about the post-war uh, order. Um, the end of the relationship between the Europe and the United States as we know it. Uh, I think we should be very careful about that because uh, that has enormous consequences also for Europe. Are we ready, just to give one example, and I'll limit myself to that remark, are we ready to, uh, to take up the consequences, what that means in terms of defense spending? That's a big question indeed, but uh, let's not enter that question in this panel. But um, uh, let me, let me uh, I think in the next panel this will certainly be, uh, be part of the debate. Uh, let me open for questions, uh, um, please. Thank you, Krishna Guha with Evercore Partners. So I, I was struck that this, uh, there seemed to me to be a large gap in this discussion around economic priorities. And that res refers specifically to counter-cyclical policies for the next downturn. It seems to me we have a discussion about you know, the need to strengthen the current expansion, and we have a, need, a discussion about the need to strengthen the long-run growth potential of the economy. It seems to me the crying need is to figure out how the system will be robust through the next downturn. Now, in the US, the private sector consensus is that this expansion has an expected life of another three years. Now, it could turn out to be five, could turn out to be one, but it seems like three years is a good place to start with in terms of setting priorities. So what's Europe going to do in the next three years that equips the economy and the society to make it through the next downturn and emerge stable, prosperous, secure? Great, thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, perhaps I collect one or two further questions. Was there a question here on the, on the right? Uh, uh, Nicola? You, t you take notes. Nicolas Veron here at Bruegel. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, probably not really a question, but a, a, a note of alarm uh, listening uh, to what Martin just said about the transatlantic relationship. Um, I spend a lot of my time in the US. Uh, I think there is a tendency when you're far away to uh, see order where there is just chaos. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's even more the case in China. So everybody in China seems to be convinced that the US president is a master strategist and has a plan and just one plan. Um, uh, in Europe, it's a bit, m I think, more accurate in vision. But still, I think there is a tendency to read a lot in uh, the ongoing chaos. So, so basically, I, I would find it completely alarming if we were to conclude that the current situation in the US is there forever. That might be the case, but that might very well not be the case. Thank you, Nicolas. So we don't know what, what's going to happen next in the US. There is a question there at the, at the end, the lady at the, all the way at the end. 
So I'm Tina Tina Khladiani from the College of Europe, and I'm very happy to hear all the highlights across the different sectors of economy. And I'm extremely happy that finally the Miss Director General mentioned about digitalization of economy. And I would like to ask you to elaborate more on this topic, because especially if we mention the short-term priorities and if we talk of the shifts of the labor force from the low productive sectors to the high productive sectors, I think the digitalization and the growth of digital economy at exponential rate is quite, quite priority today. And we should, I should like to, I would like to ask you, what the, is the EU's success story in this direction? And what are the main tools that you would highlight that actually the European Union does make an effort that the labor force across the EU and different countries uh, have sufficient digital skills? Why I'm asking about this, because if we look at the statistics, there are around like one million jobs that will still remain unfilled by 2020. So there is huge labor demand, but there is not enough labor supply across the EU countries. Thanks a lot. Thank you. P perhaps we take one more question, ideally by a woman to have gender balance. <laughs> well, okay, uh, uh, you're not a woman, but uh, okay, yeah, 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 please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, citizens. Angelos Karlaftis, Epaphos Advisors. Don't you think that uh, the American administration policies of preferences I wrote in 2010, because these policies in the economic field, it's a kind of protectionism by selection, which is called by me preferism. If we follow also in Europe this preferism, which is very, uh, a very genius approach from the American administration for making America great, we can make Europe great by following in our ways this preferism economic policies. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So I, I think we have four, four very pertinent and, and important questions. Um, Minister, I don't know if you want to, to start and pick up on one, perhaps on are we prepared for the next downturn? I don't know if you... Just a few remarks. Uh, I certainly agree with Mr. Verans point that uh, when you look at American history, we've seen this kind, maybe not that extreme, but close to it. Uh, we've seen that kinds of presidents before in the United States, so uh, this might, not sure, be over before we realize it's, uh, it's over, uh, might. Uh, with respect to counter-cyclical policies, I think it's, it's, it's uh, obvious to say that we need a normalization of policies uh, before we get into the next downturn, and that means as well with monetary policy as with uh, budgetary policy, uh, so that in terms of monetary policy, interest rate policy can be developed as it should be when the economy goes goes down. We're still at even at negative interest rates, uh, which is not an obvious point of starting point when you would get into a downturn. And in terms of budgetary policies, we should uh, make sure that uh, the automatic stabilizers can do their full and uh, unlimited work when, when the downturn starts. But as well with respect to monetary policy as with respect to budgetary policy, we're still, understatement, some uh, what, uh, away from those uh, starting points that we should have when the downturn comes, which eventually will happen. But, but, but perhaps, Maria, I can push you on this point uh, also. I mean, what do we really do? I mean, uh, the, the monetary policy is more or less at the limit, and fiscal policy is also limited in some countries. So, so do, we have, do we have the tools to... To, uh, to help the countries uh, or, you know, for those countries that don't have the fiscal space to, to, be re to react no, or do we don't have that actually? No, I think here is a, the comparison with the U.S. is a pertinent one because here we're running out of, of instruments. I mean, there are countries, and I'm thinking, for example, of Greece that has basically no zero tools. The macro tools are non-existent either on the, on the monetary side or on the fiscal side. But Italy has very little macro space as well. I mean, it has benefited from QE. At some point, that's going to finish. Um, but it has zero space on the fiscal side, and there we see how things evolve there. So on the macro side, we don't have degrees of freedom, and they vary from country to country. Those who do have the space, they really need to use it. But they are, they are, they are the ones who will be driving the aggregate demand that Martin uh, is, uh, is arguing for. The rest, if you're going to stay with the rules, which are important in the credibility of the system, uh, then the space for macro adjustment is very little. I worry about the normalization on the monetary side uh, because we still have stocks of debt that are enormous. Uh, we have legacy debts that are um, they need to be resolved. 
the risk reduction versus sharing mantra. Uh, but if we go back into normalization of monetary policy, even in the three-year horizon that you're arguing, Krishna, this is going to be problematic for those who have uh, private debts of the order of magnitude one and a half times the fiscal debts. And this is average in Europe. So I worry that the normalization uh, will bring problems in itself and it's going to jeopardize our ability to call the new normal normal. Um, so that, that, I think, is the, the, uh, the lack of instruments on the macro side in Europe is making uh, Martin's request almost impossible. And this is, this is a problem, I think, in the context of macro management. Uh, on Nicolas' point on, on the chaos, um, um, you know, if, if, if you're arguing for a waiting out uh, strategy, I think that, that of course, is very, uh, is very wise. And certainly, I think, we should, you know, European policy shouldn't be reactive. It shouldn't be active, it should be reactive. That's why we, I think it's important to have measured responses. Uh, and, but the question here is how much damage can be done in the meantime while the Uf, uh, US is coming out of what you characterize as chaos. That, I think, is the problem here. And I think in Europe we do see that. It's not that we're going to attack, but we need to counterattack. I think that, that's, that's important. So, 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 Martin, where's your famous aggressive macroeconomic policy going to come from? Yeah, I think we're... Well, just to go back to the questioner, I mean, it'd be, whenever the next downturn happens, it would be nicer if we face it from being at or above capacity rather than below it, as I think we are. So, you know, let's keep pushing. Um, but I don't think we're anywhere near the limit of macroeconomic stimulus tools. Uh, I think the preparation that needs to be done is mostly intellectual and to some extent political. The interest rates could be more negative than they are. QE can be pursued or restarted in much greater quantities than we've done. Uh, they, it can be started faster or at higher speeds and so on. Uh, and of course, there's, the, there's always the, uh, the sort of ultimate possibility of using the equity bit of the central bank balance sheet, also known as helicopter money. All of these are technically possible uh, policies. But there's a bit of an intellectual block and partly a political block against using them. This would be a good time to do the technical work to show how you would, to look at, uh, you know, develop, for example, the various Swiss uh, reserve, tiered reserve pricing mechanisms for making sure that you can have more negative interest rates, put all of the technical framework in place so that you could have more aggressive monetary policy if you need it. On the fiscal side, if the central bank is doing the right thing, then the limits to fiscal stimulus are either a sort of bond market uh, refinancing crisis uh, or it's the commission saying you can't do this. I think we can try and forestall or make refinancing crisis less likely by doing much more on reshaping the profile, the maturity profile of government debt. We've sort of missed a lot of the window of opportunity to vastly increase the average maturity. I would have liked debt managers to use 50 and 100 year bonds much, much more. If you reduce the amount of government debt you have to refinance every year to 2, 3, 4% of GDP, you will not have a refinancing crisis. Think back to 2010 and 2012, the problems happened because governments had to find 20% of GDP in a year, right? That's not necessary. Uh, finally, on the commission saying no to uh, proper counter cyclical uh, fiscal policy, you know, we should just recognize that in a recession, debt sustainability is served by demand stimulus, right? If you cut spending or increase taxes in a recession, you increase the debt-to-GDP burden more than if you stimulate. Once you recognize that, it's quite easy to argue that for the sake of the purposes of the Stability and Growth Pact, you should have more aggressive fiscal, counter-cyclical fiscal policy in a recession. All of these are kind of political, intellectual, blocks. And that's, I think, where we have to work. Laurie, there were some questions for you also. Okay. The word, to, but to pick up on my colleagues' interventions, um, the word that hasn't been said is convergence. I mean, the convergence between the different European economies. Um, I think we're very complacent about that. We sort of assume that this is okay. I don't think it is okay. There's been progress, but there's much more scope. So perhaps the political discussion could also go in that direction. You know, my regional disparities story is uh, actually a, an, a, an indictment of convergence policy 
which is also relevant from a macroeconomic perspective as well as a microeconomic or social perspective. So that wasn't in the discussion at all, so to my surprise. On the, just to pick up uh, the lady from the College of Europe, um, I think she points out a really uh, good point. I don't know how it compares to your overheating thing. Um, there are skills shortages there in Europe at the moment, uh, perhaps two to three million uh, jobs that are not being filled because we don't have the right qualified people for them. This is not just about digital skills. It's much, much deeper than that. Uh, it can, it's also, it's the STEM story, it's the digital story, but it's also stuff like, you know, tourism uh, in, in regions, in the most outer flung parts of, of the EU. Um, so I would argue for one very specific structural reform in the next three years, before the next counter-cyclical thing comes to hit us, as well as globalization, which is a massive restructuring of skills and training policies in the national and regional levels where they are, uh, where they are designed and implemented. Those skills and training policies are basically supply-side policies. They are designed by the training institutes, by the universities, by the, by the people that deliver those uh, services, and they haven't been looked at from the demand side for a very long time. So those systems need a demand side focus as a matter of urgency in the next three years, which is a today story, but it will increasingly be then a three years profile, five years, 10 years profile. If we don't revamp, if we don't look at skills development from the demand side, which is not being done now, we won't fix that. The jobs deficits will grow. And then when the next downturn comes, that will exacerbate and uh, it won't be politically pretty. All right. Um, so I think this uh, precludes our first session. Um, please join me in thanking all of our panelists uh, for their contribution. And, and let me say, we, we, resume, we resume in half an hour, and when we resume, please use the space efficiently. There's places there at the end, and move in uh, when you uh, don't sit at the corridors, but move as much as possible in, so that everybody finds a seat when we are, we are coming back at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. Oder du hast es von ihm abgeschaut oder ungefähr?